If you've been around in the charismatic movement for any length of time, you've either seen it happen or you've had it happen to you where a person in the service uh, falls out under the power of God. Sometimes you'll see it, maybe many times you have seen it or have heard of it anyway, or it's happened to you whenever someone has gone up for prayer for something, to receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Spirit, or to be healed, or uh, just for some other need to be met in their life, and you've seen the person fall down. Now, the experience goes by a variety of names. I think perhaps two of the most common are falling under the power or being slain in the Spirit. There are other names like resting in the power or going out, various uh, ways to express some type of uh, supernatural extra mental experience where a person it involves not only their mind but involves their body that they actually uh, fall down. Or if you haven't seen it go all the way, there are it's all related to the Holy Spirit's ministry, all related to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people don't go all the way down, but there is certainly a tottering of them and someone holds them up so whatever the name you want to use whatever the phrase to describe this and uh, by the way none of those are taken from one particular passage somewhere in the bible uh, the experience is there but none of the names are but regardless of that whatever the name the phenomenon is the same whether you want to call it uh, falling under the power or being slain in the spirit i think the latter of those is probably the most popular one, one currently being used although others have found their place in charismatic experience earlier. We're not talking about being shoved in the Spirit. That's another experience. That's when the Spirit's not moving and the minister decides to move the person. That's called shoving in the Spirit. We're talking about being slain in the Spirit. That's another matter. What about such an experience? Some people are real skeptical about it, especially non-charismatic people, real skeptical about it. I think it's auto-suggestion. You know, some type of hip hypnotic trance that people are in. Trance, I don't think, is a very good word because we always associate that with uh, occult-type matters, demonic matters, but there's nothing wrong with a trance. It just means it's some type of uh, supra-mental experience. Supra, S-U-P-R-A, supra-mental experience that someone is having. Or you can say supra-mental experience that someone is having. It's beyond just the normal way that their mind would function, and somehow they are in a, another realm. Uh, we shouldn't be too surprised about this whole realm, let's say, uh, because of what we have already studied about John in Revelation, in Revelation 1.10. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice uh, as of a trumpet. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And we have described uh, some of that to you, uh, what it means to be in the Spirit. I think whenever a person just has a vision, uh, there is... There is a sense in which we could say they're in this realm because they're in a different realm than a person who's standing beside them and who does not see the same vision or who do, does not see a vision at all, period. I think there are different levels to being in the Spirit. You can be like Paul. I think Paul was in the Spirit and he was caught up. He said whether in the body or out of the body, I, I cannot tell. Uh, I would assume he was out of the body and I would have other ways of explaining that, but he said he was taken to another realm. I don't think, I mean, I think it's obvious that you could not be taken in a physical body to the third heaven. That's a place of spirits, God and angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. That was a tremendous experience Paul had. And I said back in those tapes some months ago that I think ordinarily that's going to be reserved for men of that stature. Uh, I don't think that um, milkmaids are going to be the ones who are in the spirit in that way all the time. But all of us who have the spirit should have occasions where we are in the spirit and we see certain things in the Spirit. I don't think we're going to see a book like Daniel's book. That's reserved for people like Daniel. He was in the Spirit and saw things in the Spirit and wrote about all of these world empires that just, I mean, one, two, three, four came to pass. Well, he was living during one, so two, three, four came to pass and were fulfilled later in history. And some of it, of course, a whole lot of it has never been fulfilled. And it awaits the tribulation and the setting up the millennial kingdom of Christ. So it shouldn't be something that's too new to us to talk about around here, not even in this series on Revelation, since we've talked about John being in the Spirit. Uh, I didn't bring it with me. I had it on my desk, and I neglected to bring it out this morning. But I remember shortly after receiving the baptism in the Spirit myself, that means less than a year, let's say. I received in the summer, and it was the next spring. I'll never forget getting my hands on a book by Ezra Kopp, and I still have that book in my library. 
And the title of it was, and he had joined a phrase from Revelation 1.10 with a phrase from verse 17. And the title of the book was, I was in the spirit and I fell. Now, if you look at 10 and 17, we're going to be talking about verse 17, by the way, this morning and next, morning, and next Sunday and probably the next one. Uh, you can see that he took those phrases right out of the Bible verbatim. I was in the spirit. Uh, let's go over there and look at that. Some of you are not looking. None of you are. You're looking at me. So I'll look at it so we can look together. Revelation 1, 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then we have all this intervening material. I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Here's what the voice said. I turned to see the voice that spake. When I turned, I saw the lampstands. After glancing at that, I focused in on the central figure, and that was one who was like a man, who in fact was a man, but he possessed full deity as well. All of this is going on. And then we get back to John, and that's in verse 17. So we've had him in 10. He was in the spirit and he heard. And 12, he turned and saw. And 17, and when I saw, I fell. You see, you've got to sometimes skip over the intervening material, which we've already taught on, to uh, follow the flow of the narrative. I like that. He said he was in the spirit, and after he was in the spirit, he says three different things happened. I heard, then I saw, and then I fell. <laughs> he heard something, and then whenever he saw the, um, the object of what he was hearing or the origin of what he was hearing, he could no longer stand up. He didn't fall after he heard, he fell after he saw. He was in the spirit, and then he heard something, and then he saw something, and then he said, and then I fell. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. So that's probably why verses 10 and 17 have kind of been favorites. You know, with me, you know, whenever you, especially back in early days, or it's not even true in early days, it could be true right now, just some message that you hear me preach or some idea you come across just sticks with you forever, it seems like. And then, of course, a whole lot of things, you heard them once and you forgot about them. You probably won't remember them for a long time or maybe ever again. But there are some passages that you'll never forget because you remember a certain context in which you first heard that. Now, all of the verses that you know, you heard them first in a certain context. But for some reason, the connection isn't there. It doesn't stay with you forever. But there are some verses that you never forget. And here, too, I never forgot because of the title of that book. It was a new book to me, a new experience to me, and I'd had it happen. And now I was reading about it from someone else's perspective and pointing out the fact that here it is with with the old faithful prophet John. He wasn't too old to be slain in the spirit. I mean, there is a connection. Let me comment on the term. Maybe that sounds um, um, a little, I can't think of the word, uh, a little profane. Maybe it rhymes with slain. Maybe that's the word to use. A little profane, slain in the spirit. It certainly does have something to do with the spirit, always with the Holy Spirit. And there is right here in John's writing, verse 10, verse 17, I was in the spirit and I fell. And it has to do with more than that. It has to do with the immediate presence of God. I was in the spirit and I saw the Lord and I fell as a result of that. Slain, I mean, it's all right in the spirit, slain in the spirit, slain. Well, it, it could sound profane, like the spirit goes around killing people, just knocking them over or something. But, you know, that's not such a bad term after all whenever you realize that on at least two occasions, I think, Acts 10 and Acts 11, Peter, and it's in the Greek, Peter uses the word fall for the baptism in the Spirit. The Spirit fell on them as on us at the beginning. He's writing in chapter 11 about the experience of Cornelius and his household, the Gentiles in chapter 10, and whenever he says he compares it to as on us at the beginning, then that means you could also call the Acts 2 experience a falling of the Holy Spirit. We read about a rushing mighty wind and tongues of fire sat upon each of them and they were filled with the Spirit. But if Peter's, um, if, if we take Peter's, uh, statement over in chapter 11 that it also applies for their experience that the Holy Spirit fell on them. Well, you could also call that profane. I mean, what, what's the Holy do Spirit doing falling on top of us all the time? But you see, something is meant to be conveyed by that. In slain in the Spirit, it's like a person is slain. If you've had it happen to you, you go out as though you've been shot through the heart with a 44 handgun or something. You just go out or if you've seen somebody else. So I don't have any problem with that phrase. Falling under the power, I think that was Catherine Kuhlman's favorite phrase, and so, since she had such a, 
a, a ministry, a, such an influential ministry on so many people and so many people's lives for several decades, that has also become an accepted and popular phrase to describe this experience, falling under the power. You don't have the, uh, the profane word slain in there, but you also don't have spirit. You don't have some immediate reference to the Holy Spirit. And I think that is what this has to do with. So what about this experience? I was saying that some people are skeptical about it. Uh, not only non-charismatics, but some people who are charismatic are skeptical. Uh, that is until it happens to them. And, you know, you can hardly be skeptical anymore. They're probably just a little naive about the awesome power of God's presence whenever it is really manifested in a unique and special way. If you read the revival books of the last couple of centuries and charismatic testimonials of today, uh, many of them write of this matter. Uh, I can't speak for all that's ever happened to people in so-called revivals. I certainly can't speak for everything that's happened, but I can agree with, I can agree with anything that has happened that finds its warrant and basis, precedent for it, in the Word of God. Which brings me to this. Why don't we get into the Word of God and see whether or not there is some good, copious, biblical warrant for this? I can say that there is ample, not, not only ample, but even abundant biblical precedent and warrant, a biblical witness for this type of experience happening with people in both the Old and the New Testament. Now, I could have divided all these passages up into certain categories. You can look at all of these uh, as we go through them, and you could say, well, this one appears to be more like this, and maybe this is definitely an involuntary experience, and this one seems to be a voluntary uh, um, prostration, and this one's questionable. It's borderline. We couldn't prove one way or the other. Is it voluntary, involuntary? But I decided not to divide them up. I just think we'll read them in the English canonical order, and uh, let you look at them and make your own mind up about them. I see at least 20 passages in the Bible, at least, and I didn't do a real thorough study on this at all, but 20 ought to be enough. Two or three ought to establish a matter, so 20 ought to more than establish it. I see at least 20 passages that are pertinent to this experience. And you'll clearly note, please, as we look at these, one major common denominator in all of these texts. They're different people, different times, in the temple, out of the temple, on Patmos Island, all over the place. There are various things that are not common, but one major common denominator, probably the major common denominator in all of these texts is, is a supernatural awareness, I mean a heightened awareness of the immediate power and presence of the Lord. Now, I think that will also be true in tremendous workings of miracles or workings of powers, as the Greek would say, and uh, other gifts of the Spirit. There is going to be a heightened awareness of the immediate power and presence of the Lord. I think I even described John's experience of being in the Spirit and having this tremendous revelation as being a heightened visionary experience. Uh, all believers or any believer could have a vision, but this is a heightened visionary experience. I don't think any of our visions last 22 chapters with such... Um, copious, intimate, intricate details of one horse and the second horse and the third horse and colors of all of them. And then we've got three series of seven, you know, the seven uh, trumpets, uh, the seven seals and seven trumpets and seven vials. Our visions aren't like that. This is a heightened visionary experience of John Hess. But as we'll see with being slain in the spirit or falling under the power, it happens to all different types of people. It happens to save people. So you know what I'm going to say after that, which is kind of a surprise. And it happens to unsaved people. Right in the Bible it does. Right in the Bible it does. So if it happens to an unsaved person, then it certainly ought to be something that's for us. I mean, if it's, a, if it's an expression of the immediate power and presence of God, then surely it'd be something open for the believer. And that's not something that you go seeking. It's just something that happens. Nobody, as you'll see in all of these experiences, nobody has sought anything. God is the sovereign spirit. When you remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, especially how he in his discussion of the spirit and his gifts is always putting such an emphasis there on the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. Now, he's not ruling us out. He's not meaning a fate, fatalism or determinism that we're just absolute pawns and we have nothing to do or say because he's encouraging us to stir up and be zealous and desire. But he's saying the spirit divides the gifts severally as he wills. Yet he also tells us to seek earnestly the best gifts. The Spirit 
the Spirit is going to often work and sovereignly, sovereignly uh, give the gifts or divide out the gifts according to the earnest desires of his people. I think Jesus teaches us, for instance, in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 12, and then you get 9 through 11, which is talking about the Holy Spirit. I think he's teaching us there in Luke 11 that the reception of the Spirit and his ministry and his gifts uh, is found in the context of intense prayer. Remember, prior to that teaching on, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, then how much more shall your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Notice it's talking about asking. Prior to that, he gives the illustration of the man who arrives at one's house and said, friend, uh, give me three loaves for a friend of mine has come and I don't have anything to give. And the man says, I'm in bed with my children and it's too late and I cannot rise and give. And Jesus said, but because of the man's persistence, his importunity, then the man arose and gave him all that he needs. So he said to us, ask, seek, knock, and ye shall receive and find and the door shall be opened unto you. So God's not telling us just wander about life as a nobody and not thinking about anything and one day maybe somewhere if you get lucky down the road if I'm not busy something might happen supernatural to you. He's not telling us that at all. Paul says anything but that. He says to be zealous. Amen. We even get our word zeal and zealous right from the Greek. It's almost a transliteration of the Greek word which also is Z-E-L-O something right from the Greek be zealous and the Greek means the same as the English so since you know what zealous in English means you wouldn't have to look up the Greek word in 1 Corinthians 12 like chapter 14 and verse 1 it will say the same thing all right so what I was saying is one thing you'll note through a brief look at some of these passages is that there is a common denominator and that's an awareness of God's power of his immediate power and presence Old Testament New Testament saint sinner I can't explain why God chooses certain people and certain times with certain people to manifest himself. I guess if we could explain all that, it, it would take away the mystery and the transcendence of it. I can't explain why there would be occasions when I was in high school just sitting at my desk doing math and I would have to hold on to my desk so I didn't fall out of it. I wasn't reading the Bible. Now, sometimes I was. And I had to hold on with my legs and my hands. Oh, I've had many experiences like that. Many. The Lord, there's a certain way, and I don't even try to describe it, because if you try to describe something, then everyone else tries to compare their experience with that and say, well, I never had that, so it couldn't be genuine with me. And God can work in a tremendous variety of ways. Where it's some, some certain thing he does bodily for you whenever his presence is there, that if you try to describe it, then again, it almost, it'll never try to describe what it means. Now, how did it feel whenever it just says they were gone? John just says, I fell. Well, he gives one description. He said, I was like a dead man. We know what that means, just boom, you're gone. I don't know if it's back stiff board or the knees just crumple, but it's like a dead man. When you're dead, you're not going down feeling your way as you go down. When you're dead, you're dead. But now, what did it feel like, John? How did, were you, he does, he can't. Paul said he heard in the third heaven. Sometimes heaven comes down to earth. You don't have to go up to it. Paul said he heard words in the third heaven that were both unlawful and impossible to explain. They were inexplicable. He couldn't explain them. He couldn't describe them. Speaking in tongues, the anointing, things like that are things that you can't really explain. You just, they're in the word, you believe them, and you experience them. Sometimes we can explain what they're not, like speaking in tongues is not auto-suggestion. It's not mimicking something else that you've heard. And it's not quoting uh, various vestigial remains, various vestigial remains of Latin that you remembered back in the ninth grade in school. <laughs> well, maybe I can quote something out of Caesar's Gallic Wars or something that I remember back in those days. Say, I didn't even have Latin. Well, good, you're better off then. You don't have any foreign language phrases floating around in your mind. Whatever you're speaking is really going to be Swahili or Tahiti or something, then it'll be real. It won't be a mixture of various languages that you've heard. I remember one time, I'm going to get into these. If you want to go back to Genesis, that's where we're going to start. We're going to take the time to read all of these, and I don't know that we're going to get much more done than, than that this morning because there are a lot of them. 
I remember it right after, I mean, right after I got baptized in the Spirit August the 3rd, 1975. So I was just, you know, not even a month away from school starting again. So right after that, I would be in class. I mean, it lasted the whole fall and, and it has continued to last, but especially that fall. And I remember, I don't guess it was math class as so much as English class. I remember in English. Uh, I remember one time we, I mean, right after I got baptized in the Spirit, I forget, 10th, 11th grade English or whatever, we had to compose some poem, and I wrote one on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, everything you could do was, and I had to get tongues in there for all my Baptist friends out there, and you go up in front of the class and read the poem and everything, and, well, it's English, you got to make up stuff like that, but I can remember, I sat on the last row, way in the very back of the room, uh, and I remember many times back there, I remember one occasion where I had, uh, I'd had several warts on various fingers of mine, one before I was saved, I had gone and had it cut off, which wasn't any fun. They deadened, uh, I still got the scar on my hand. By the way, I've still got the doctor's scar from that. I don't have any scars from the ones the Lord took off. I've still got a scar on the back of my left hand where they inject things around it to deaden it and get the knife out and it's red hot and glowing and they slice that thing off and, that's, and it probably cost my parents five or six hundred dollars. <laughs> I don't know. God doesn't leave any scars whenever he takes things off. They were instantly dissolved. And it was during one of those times of being in the spirit, holding on to my desk to stay in the desk so I wouldn't fall out. Now, I didn't, no one around me was about to fall out. You can be having an experience yourself and, and nobody else around even knows. Now, sometimes they might know something, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes here in the Bible, if someone brings up the question, well, what about these multiple occasions? You know, I've heard of old Pentecostal services where... Just the whole front row went over like dominoes. Hey, I can give you passages where 120 priests couldn't stand up. 120 of them. I got biblical warrant for multiple slayings in the spirit. He knocks over a whole company of men. Jesus did in John chapter 18. They said, where's Jesus of Nazareth? He said, I'm he. And they all went backwards and fell to the ground. And that's a whole, that's 600 men. A whole squadron of Roman soldiers came then. So I can find uh, plenty of passages for a single lone individual out on the desert or on a rocky barren island of Patmos just one Sunday morning. I don't know. You like to go back and read into your Bible things that aren't there. Now, what was John doing? He probably got up that morning and probably said, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't believe he was complaining about anything. Uh, Lord, this is the resurrection morning here. My mind is back on what happened all those years ago. I was a witness of all of that. John, remember, stood there, and Jesus, right hanging on the cross, committed his mother to John and John to his mother. John saw all of that happen. And he's probably ready to intercede and pray for the Roman leaders because he knew what he was supposed to do. They're the ones that put him there. And pray for the churches back in Ephesus and back in Asia Minor. And somehow, of course, I'm reading things in that aren't there, but somehow in the midst of all of that, John ends up being in the spirit, seeing this, he falls, then he gets back up, and the Lord begins to show him uh, all of these things. Let's start in Genesis 15. Genesis 15. <clears throat> Some of these will be clearer than others. Some, there's no question about the involuntary nature of it all. I'll comment on that. You'll see what I mean by that as we go along. I think teaching on matters like this increases our awareness of the whole situation, which will probably make you a potential candidate for such experiences. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. All right, so Abraham is awake. This isn't a dream. He is awake. He's not asleep. And he has a vision. God's word came to him. So in some way, he sees, hears this in vision, saying, fear not. By the way, that's the first thing Jesus said to John in Revelation 1.17. Saying, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. reward. Now, Abram's conversing with the Lord in the vision. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. All right, now that's all taken place in vision. Now, <clears throat> let's start into verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. 
And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. <clears throat> now you have an interesting situation here. I don't want to get into all of the technicalities of it, but I just thought that God took him and showed him all the stars of heaven, right? All the stars of heaven. Well, what are birds coming down? Birds don't come out at nighttime. I mean, if stars are out, then it's dark, it's black, it's nighttime. And yet in verse 11, when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So evidently, we're still talking about that word vision in verse 1. This is still going on through vision, at least a part of this. Now we've got verse 12, but when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. So the sun hadn't gone down earlier, now the, or the sun had gone down earlier, because you've got the stars of heaven already out in verse 5, and yet here you've got it going down now for the first time in verse 12. So something's either out of order, or uh, Abram is still seeing things in a vision. But what I want to do is just get to verse 12. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Now, this isn't a natural sleep. Don't we all know that? He didn't just take a snooze, as they say here. He is, he is in a deep, this isn't just a sleep, this is a deep sleep. And lo and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And I think that has to do with the prediction that God goes on to give him. Next page in my Bible, but just the next few verses where it speaks of his descendants going down for several hundred years into a strange land. And I think the imagery of darkness, a great darkness, and the horror of that, I think that would um, <clears throat> bid well with the experience that the Israelites have down there, making brick, and Pharaoh won't even give them straw after Moses has come down, and they are in great bondage and cruel servitude down there, and they cry out to God to deliver them. That would um, bode well, the horror and the darkness of this passage with what we find over there. So whether you want to call this being slain in the spirit or whatever, this is a supernatural experience that Abram is going through where it is, um, he's out, he's not standing up, he's down. A deep sleep has fallen upon him, and it's a deep sleep that has come from God. Now there are, uh, there are other experiences where this happens, and I don't even have those listed among the 20 passages. Remember whenever David uh, came upon Saul's group, and just to show Saul that, that he was a righteous man, not trying to take his life, Saul's whenever he could. Saul just felt David was somehow out to get him, and so Saul was going to, you know, get him. You get that man before he gets you. And one time God sent a deep sleep upon Saul and his armor bearer and all of his men so that David could send his best man down there and take Saul's water bottle and spear and sword and everything right out from under their nose. You'd never dare do something like that. Saul was what? He was a warrior. He was a man of the field. A man like that would wake up whenever a cricket scratches his back. You would never be so sleepy, not as a warrior trained like Saul was. Saul was a mighty warrior. And, just, and, and certainly the other men, when somebody, in other words, would have come out of their sleep, they couldn't. They were under the power of God. You believe God can do that? Sure, God can put you out of sleep where you can't wake up. <laughs> One of those is called death where you never wake up. God can put you in that sleep and nobody can get out of that. Spirit of man, Ecclesiastes says, does not have control over it the spirit of man. You don't have the power to retain your own spirit. But I'm talking about a temporary one where God can put a person in a deep sleep and they can't get out of it until God releases them. So you could say in one sense, what's the difference then? Being slain in the spirit or going in a deep sleep? It's all by the power of God that people don't have any control over. All right, chapter 17. There, there's one experience I'd list, Genesis 15. And I'm not even going to give you the other ones where it talks about a deep sleep. Because I know people would quibble over that and say, well, that doesn't look like what happens in charismatic services where people go up and have hands laid on them and they fall out. Genesis 17, verses 1, 2, and 3. When Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram 
Now, I take this as a theophany because in chapter 15, it said the Lord appeared to him in a vision and spoke to him. And here we, it's not qualified by he appeared to him in a vision. It's just the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me <clears throat> and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. See the word F-E-double-L? -L? Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying. It's exactly what happened to John in Revelation 1.17. He fell on his face and Jesus talked with him saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that was dead and I am alive and I am alive forevermore and have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things that thou hast seen and the things that are and the things that shall be hereafter. It goes on and talks to him for the next couple of chapters. For the continuation... the things that thou hast seen and the things that are and the things that shall be hereafter. And he goes on and talks to him for the next couple of chapters. So there's another account. How about Leviticus? Leviticus chapter 9. Leviticus, um, is this 8 and 9? Yeah, Leviticus 8 and 9 together had to do with the consecration of Aaron and his sons to officiate as the priests. We've got a lot of information about uh, sacrifice and the various clothing that has to be worn by Aaron and by his sons. <clears throat> You've got this <clears throat> eight-day period of um, uh, sanctification or being set apart, consecration, let's say an eight-day period, 9-1. It came to pass on the eighth day <clears throat> that Moses called Aaron and his sons, and they go through this um, experience and <clears throat> or this... Um, uh, dedicating of them, and look down into verses 23 and 24. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. Now, that doesn't mean the whole nation because you couldn't get three million people at the door of the tabernacle, but representatives. Remember, the, the, the tribes were divided up into heads over thousands and heads over hundreds and heads over fifties and heads over tens. Certain of those leaders there <coughs> were here before the tabernacle. It said they shouted and they fell on their faces. Numbers 24. Let's get into uh, an experience where we have as the subject, certainly a heathen man, this is the prophet of Mesopotamia, Balaam by name. He's called a false prophet by Peter in 2 Peter 2, where he speaks of the, the fact that the ass was forbidding the madness of the prophet, and obviously he was a false one. Now, of course, he could give true prophecy, and that was only because the Spirit came upon him. Didn't Caiaphas over in John's gospel somewhere in the middle of John's gospel utter an accurate, true prophecy? He doesn't, he doesn't know that he's doing that, but the Spirit took his tongue and used it. Numbers 24, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, then he begins taking things for granted. He went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, now, that may be a spiritual experience rather than just a literal one, or both. And the Spirit, capital S, I don't know why the King James always wants to give a small case when it should be capital case. The Spirit of God came upon him. <laughs> you know, this is an enigmatic figure. I remember one time being down at Westminster Seminary uh, talking with some of the professors and students, and we had a lecture down there when I was just visiting one time, and... and uh, Walky there, one of the professors, gave a, a lecture on Balaam, which was really interesting because this is an enigmatic figure. He just pops it up and then he just goes away. And he's obviously not a Jew. He's, ob he, he's obviously a, a Gentile. And he's obviously not on the, on the order of a Job or someone like that. He's a heathen. He's a heathen while he's prophesying. 
Very enigmatic section, 22 and 23 and 24 here. How and why God has brought in a heathen prophet to do what this man does. But anyway, he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Now, let me call your attention to the fact that that phrase, into a trance, is italicized. That's not in the Hebrew. I looked it up. I don't know why they want to throw that in there. The Hebrew simply says falling, but having his eyes open. Falling. Why add into a trance? It doesn't say that in the Bible. It just says that he fell. So in light of all of the other experiences where in, in the Bible people are having these tremendous things while they're on the, on the ground, not while they're standing up. Daniel will have that. Sometimes it's before the experience. Sometimes it's during it. Many times it's after it. John falls kind of in the middle after he's seen one thing and then before Jesus goes on to say other things. But all the Hebrew says is he hath said which heard the words of God which saw the vision of the Almighty falling but having his eyes open. I think what the King James translators thought they were saying, and of course it's possible, but the Hebrew doesn't say this, is that there's a contrast between something and having his eyes open. So they say, well, how about having him in a trance? That way you're in a trance, you know, like a stuffed mummy or something. Like a robot would be the picture they would probably have. Well, not robots in 1611, but us today. And, uh, and yet his eyes are open. But since that's not what the Hebrew says, then that's just a guess. That's filling in where you don't really have any warrant to do it. Falling, but having his eyes open. Well, you say, well, still, it could go another way. All right, let's just keep looking. I, I'm telling you, some of these are more conclusive than others. Joshua chapter 5. You'd have to make a separate list of the different people this has happened to. You'd have to say Abram. Then you'd have to say many, probably hundreds at least scores of the heads of the tribes of Israel. That's Leviticus 9. Now Balaam, now Joshua. Last three verses, Joshua 5, 13, 14, 15. came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay. But as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Reminds me of Exodus 3 whenever God appeared to Moses. At early stage of his ministry, commissioning him to do a work, and here's Joshua just before leading the people victoriously across the river Jordan. Or they're across, but leading him into their first battle, Jericho. And maybe it reminded Joshua. Surely he had heard the story from Moses if he had not read it by this time of what happened in Exodus chapter 3. Then we've got Judges chapter 13, the prediction of the birth of Samson with Manoah, Samson's father, and Manoah's wife, Samson's mother. They've got an appearance of the angel of the Lord, an appearance of God to them. He's called a man of God. In other words, a prophet in verse 8. He's called a man in verse 10. He's called the angel of God in verse 9. He's called the angel of the Lord in verse 16. And then finally, he's just called God in verse 22 very interesting they go from a man to a prophet to an angel to God himself so what we need in this is let's say verse 19 so Manoah took a kid with a meal offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord and the angel did wondrously and Manoah and his wife looked on or it came to pass I think this explains uh, how or what the angel did that was so Wonderful. It came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Now, that's certainly not a man who gets into a flame and goes up with it. Ascended in the flame of the altar and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. 
And then we read in verse 22, Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. 1 Samuel 19, 20 through 24. Another unusual experience when Saul has sent messengers to, I'm sure you'll recall this, very bizarre behavior, especially manifested at the very end of this chapter by Saul. When he sent messengers to David, verse 20, when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, and the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Here's a little bit of that sharing business. David is there, and Samuel, as the leader of the prophets, the band or the company of the prophets, and all of them around, and all of them prophesying. And the messenger sent by Saul, this is a supernatural experience, are so overcome by it all, they're sent to take him. If you read the context, verse 18, they're sent to bring him back so Saul can kill him. And they're so overcome by the power of God, the Spirit resting upon these prophets, that they start prophesying as well. And it was told Saul, and he sent other messengers. So this is the second attempt, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Can't overcome the Spirit, you see. Then when he also to Raymond came to a great well that is in Siku, and he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naoth and Raymond. And this is Saul himself. So I'll take care of this. I'll get to the bottom of this. Yeah, I've sent, you know, it's, it's like the three companies of men that were sent after Elijah. First, fire consumed. Second, fire consumed. Third, got wise and said, God, be merciful to me here at the foot of your servant. And the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied, and then he came to Naoth and Ramah. And look at the last verse, and he stripped off his clothes also. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean all of them. It might just mean all of the outer, especially the kingly garments, and be down to underclothes, we would say. He stripped off, his, and, and naked doesn't contradict that later. Naked can mean not necessarily all the clothes. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down. See, we got him down. He lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Of course, he wasn't. He was an unregenerate man. But he's prophesying so much. They say, what's happened? Has he become one of the member of the band of the prophets there? Whatever you want to make of this bizarre experience, I don't have a difficult problem with it at all. It's kind of like, the situation with Balaam, God has just chosen to manifest his mighty power through the Spirit. The Spirit comes on Saul so mightily that he strips off his kingly garments, and a king wouldn't do this, and he lays down on the ground and prophesies. Lays down all day and all night. Now, that's some control of the Spirit. This isn't a false spirit controlling him. This is the Holy Spirit controlling him. You think of what's, what all is involved right there. You're down to your undergarments, and not only that, but you're a king down to your undergarments. And you lay down on the ground all day and all night prophesying. That's quite a control of the Spirit upon an individual's life. Amen. First uh, Chronicles 21. We'll go right in order and look at all of these. First Chronicles 21. And whenever we have time, of course, we'll comment on this business, this phenomenon. 21.16. Here David has sinned in numbering the people and God has given him a series of choices and he said, well, let me fall in the hands of God, not into the hands of men. And so God sends an angel to destroy part of the people because of David's sin. The angel finally makes his way to Jerusalem to destroy it. We read in verse 16, And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a, having a drawn sword in his hand, stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were already, you see, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. Second Chronicles 5, 13 and 14, Dedication of the Temple. You've got a company of 120 priests, verse 12, you'll see, blowing the trumpets. Solomon has built the temple. The temple is going to be a temporary, visible house for God. They can't contain him, but he is so pleased as to temporarily manifest his presence here in this place, and that is in the Holy of Holies. 
But we know that's a holy place. We know that God, his presence, remember that, his presence is there in an unusual way. Because should anyone go into that place but the high priest, and but the high priest under certain conditions, he would immediately be smitten dead by God. One time, a man who was concerned, but concerned not enough about biblical requirements, concerned over God's ark, that whenever the auction shook it, he put his hand on it to steady it, and he was smitten dead instantly. That wasn't out in the spirit. That was dead by the power of the spirit. And, of course, David was so fearful over that, I think he almost was a little upset with God. Why, God? This man is simply trying to protect your ark. But God said, you've got to do it according to my laws, which is, by the way, a good verse saying that you can have good motives and good intentions. But if you don't do things the way God says to do them, you're in a lot of trouble. He can only be merciful under certain conditions, and that was one where he just could not be merciful. He had to show the people, this is serious business here. You don't touch the ark. You don't touch the ark in being a common man, and you don't carry the ark on animals. That was against the law anyway. The priests were to have staves on their shoulders, and the ark was to be born that way. And here they have loaded up on a car and oxen pulling in. God never told them to do that. I don't know if you realize that, but as they carried that thing through the wilderness, they carried that thing. Men put that thing on their shoulder, and you know how much gold weighs. And it was overlaid inside and outside with gold. Men carried that thing. You don't put that on a car. It's too holy. And have oxen pull it. Men carry that. But when Oazza put forth his hand to steady that because the oxen were stumbling, then immediately he was smitten dead by God. Which, as I say, is a good principle in the Old Testament. We hear all these people saying, well, as long as you have good intentions and good motives and God reads your heart and everything else is okay. Well, under certain circumstances, he might could be forbearing and long-suffering, but under others, he couldn't. So it's just better to know what the Bible says so we can get in line with that. The sooner, the better. Well, anyway, this is a glorious time whenever they have built the temple. Now they're dedicating it. And what I was going to say is that it is an invitation now. Come, God, from above and dwell in this place as you have told us you are pleased to do. He said, I'll dwell between the outstretched arms of the cherubim or their wings. So it's an invitation to come and dwell. Later we're going to get to a passage where we see God leaving in Ezekiel. His glory takes up, lifts off, and departs from the temple. It had been there from this period we're reading about in 2 Chronicles to that period we will read about in Ezekiel, right before the final fall of the city. God lifted his presence because he's not going to be in the room whenever the Babylonians burst through. He's gone. He didn't have any time for the heathen. And we'll see again in Ezekiel that God's presence comes back. But that's in the millennial temple. And it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. In other words, there's great unity here. When they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, drop the K for English today, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud. Now that's a visible appearance. Everybody saw that. Even the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister. Lord. Now, what do you think could not stand? Does that mean like, I just couldn't stand that? No, they could not stand. They could not stand up. They could not remain standing. So that the priest, so don't read the wrong understanding of could not stand into that. So that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now, that's a whole company. You can look in verse 20 and see you've got at least 120 priests there. And none of them were able to stand up. The high priest led probably by all the others, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, the leaders of the choirs among the Levites and the priests, they could not stand. They could not remain standing because of the immediate presence of God. Am I coming through to you on this being slain in the spirit? Whatever you want to call it, we're finding it under all types of contexts here. But there's always one thing that's true, and that is the immediate presence and power of God. It doesn't just happen when you just feel just normal and you just normally fall down. By the way, this is being slain in the spirit. This isn't suicide in the spirit where you kill yourself or where you fall over like, I think I might could fall if I just would lean a little more. I could probably, that's called suicide in the spirit. This is called being slain in the spirit. All right, there's a difference between being shoved in the spirit, suicide in the spirit, and being slain in the spirit. One time another man does it to you, one time you do it to yourself, and the other time 
which is a biblical time, is when God is the one who takes control. Praise God. Ezekiel's book. Let's jump way over to the uh, major prophet Ezekiel. Uh, chapter 1 is his uh, tremendous supernatural experience with the presence of God. Let's get down to the last verse and then the first couple of verses of the next chapter. Ezekiel 1.28, As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And I heard a voice of one that spake. Bad chapter division here, really bad. I mean, just terrible. You should have put the, at least the last phrase of verse 28 down into the next chapter. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet and I will speak to thee, which is a double way of saying he's down. We just were told that he's down. And if God has to come and tell you to get up, then obviously the implication is you're not up now. You're down. But notice verse 2. He couldn't even get up. The Spirit, he says, entered into me when he spake to me and Let's supply a pronoun. And he set me upon my feet. And then I heard him speak unto me. Now that surely has to be about the most explicit of any of the passages. That he is, this is totally involuntary. He falls down. And proof that it is, I mean absolute proof that it is completely involuntary is that he cannot even get up again himself. He says, the spirit knocked me over and the spirit entered me in some unique special way. He didn't say, stand upright on thy feet, son of man. He says, stand upright, but I know you can't do it until I do it for you. And the Spirit comes into him and lifts him up, bodily lifts him up, and puts him back on his feet so that he can hear the word of God. He said, son of man, stand, but he couldn't. It's like Augustine said, command what thou wilt, or, or give what thou commandest, and command what thou wilt. The Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me upon my feet. Then over in chapter 3, we're going to see it again. Let's just get one verse here, 23. When I arose, then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there as the glory which I saw by the river of Kibar. That's his chapter 1 experience. And I fell upon my face. And again, he says, the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. People should not be skeptical of these things because they're in the Bible. And the skeptics are pretty much assuring themselves they'll never be one to experience any of this. Chapter 43. Let's see how many more of these we can get read before we're out of time this morning. Chapter 43, verses 1 uh, through probably 4. Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. By the way, earlier here, we've seen the glory of God depart, the glory of God leave the temple. Now we're over into a millennial context when God's glory is going to again come back into the temple as it was from the days of Solomon to the Babylonian captivity. And his voice was like a noise of many waters. That sounds like something John said in Revelation 1. The earth shined with his glory, and it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city, and the visions, that's when the glory departed, Babylonian captivity, and the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kibar that takes us back to his canal Kibar experience he had in chapter 1. He was among the exiles, remember, sitting by this tributary to Tigris-Euphrates River, a canal called Kibar, and I fell upon my face. The glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east, so the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Now, that could be a case where he's still on his face and he goes by the Spirit or in spirit in visionary form or fashion because it doesn't say the Spirit set him on his feet and then picked him up and took him. Whenever he's being taken places, like in chapter 10, it appears that he's taken, even when it says by the locks of his hair, he's taken in the visions of God. If you read chapter 10, in the visions of God, he is taken. Then in chapter 44 and verse 4, 
Then brought he me the way of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell upon my face. Always they saw the glory, they saw the cloud, or Abraham, God appeared to him, or, or Joshua, the captain of the host of the Lord, appeared to him. It's always in the, God's always present in a special, unique way. We could say in a manifest, discernible way, so that you actually feel that. Daniel eight seventeen. real quickly, Daniel has reached the end of one of his visions. So he came near where I stood. When he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. I fell upon my face. Chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, which I'm not going to read now because that, that whole context from 1 through 11 is very similar to what John experienced in Revelation 1 in seeing Jesus. So I think I'll read that uh, the next go around. Matthew 17, 6. Now we're over into New Testament days. Mount of Transfiguration. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. That's the voice of the Father speaking from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In Matthew 28, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 4, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. There's a great sound and a quaking of the earth. And the Lord, or an angel from the Lord, descends to roll away the stone from the tomb. And the, the countenance of this angel was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow, verse 3. And for fear of him, the keepers, that is the guards, did shake and became as dead men. They shook first and then they fell. Remember, a dead man, you're never going to find a dead man standing up. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and we could say, and then they fell because that's where you're going to find a dead man is on the ground. Then we've got John's gospel. Probably one of the most unusual experiences is John 18. John 18 verses 1 through 6. We've got a whole group of of soldiers who have come. John 18, verse uh, 3, Judas went, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, uh, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. I've shown you that is a contingent of both Jewish and Roman soldiers, Roman soldiers and Levitical temple police, Jewish police. A band right there is the Roman aspect. Jew Judas then having received a band Ban speaks of a group of 600 Roman soldiers and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. Those would be the, that would be the temple police force that would be made up of the Levites. And of course, they've come across the brook Kidron to the garden where Judas knew that Jesus often resorted. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, now that already should alert us to the fact that, we're, that Jesus and we are in an unusual state here. Jesus is not having to ask who touched me here. This is an unusual manifestation of the Spirit through him and in his light. Anytime you find a phrase like this, Jesus knowing all things that should come upon him. He wasn't always conscious of the knowledge that he could have. On occasions, he had to ask questions like, who touched me? Why couldn't he just know? Well, it's because he didn't operate the manifestation of the Godhead independent of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit worked them through him, then he did them. But here, the Holy Spirit certainly is working. He knows all things. And he says, Whom seek ye? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. John throws that in to say, let us know. Now, Judas is there too. Look at verse 6. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Try to explain that to me. Most commentators have a real hard time saying, well, they were just so shocked by his, by his demeanor that he had like, you know, real stern demeanor that they just had to back up and there were big stones behind them and they tripped over those stones and fell. I've read that in the commentaries. Well, you got, you know, 700 men that all backed up at once. And, or maybe it even sound better to say that the the guy in the back fell, and then the second guy backed up and tripped over him, and then just got... That's not what the passage is saying, though. <laughs> See, when you're non-charismatic, you have a real difficult way 
real difficult, hard time trying to explain such a passage like this. Well, maybe even if you're charismatic, you say, I still don't know what's going on. Some type of power has overcome these men. Because Jesus is under an unusual anointing here. And he just says, I am he. And it's not his demeanor or the look on his face or the sternness in his voice. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that the Spirit's not mentioned here, but I believe that's what overcomes these men. We read, as soon as they heard what he said, as soon as he said to them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. So I guess you wouldn't call this falling on your face. You'd call this falling on the back of your head. Because they went backward and fell to the ground. And then finally we've got in Acts chapter 9 verses 3 and 4 and then verse 8. Saul's experience. That great light came from heaven, remember? And knocked him to the ground because we read later that when he arose. <laughs> well, that implies he was chewing on some dirt before then. Oh, that's a proud man here sat at Gamaliel's feet. And he's gnawing on dirt like a rattlesnake, calling Jesus Lord, saying, what must I do? And if you read chapter 26 in verse 14, you see that it not only knocked him down, but it knocked all the rest of the men down as well. So that's Acts 9, 3, and 4. He said, when this light shone round about him, then he fell to the earth. Verse 8, he arose from the earth. And then 26, 14, when we arose... <laughs> They were all on the ground. Now that should be about 19 passages there. And so let me give you number 20 and we're going to have to stop this morning. Number 20, of course, is Revelation 117. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me. I saw and then I fell at his feet as dead. 